Proteins, the main building blocks of cells, perform a vast variety of functions, aided by their structural features. In order to understand the basis of protein's functional three-dimensional structure, we will examine the different levels of protein structure and the chemical factors that drive and determine this structure. Let's begin with the four levels of protein structure, starting with the primary structure. Proteins are composed of a series of amino acids connected together by covalent peptide bonds. This is the first level of protein structure, the primary structure. Notice that the two ends of the peptide are different. This end, on the left of the peptide, contains an amino group and is called the N-terminus. The other end, to the right, has a carboxyl group and is referred to as the C-terminus. Amino acyl residues are always numbered, starting from the N-terminus and progressing towards the C-terminus. Also note the orientation of the polypeptide backbone, formed by the repeated sequence of the amide nitrogen, the alpha carbon, and the carbonyl carbon for each amino acyl residue in the chain. Most peptide bonds are in the trans configuration, rather than in the cis configuration. The trans configuration is more favorable, since it reduces the steric hindrance that occurs between the functional groups of adjacent amino acyl residues. A protein in its primary structure is also referred to as a polypeptide. Proteins, however, do not exist in this structure in the aqueous environment of the cell. The long strands of amino acid will fold upon itself into more complex secondary structures. Two common secondary structures are the alpha helices and the beta sheets. A protein will continue to fold on itself, ultimately leading to the third level of structure known as the tertiary structure. If a protein is made of just one polypeptide, then the tertiary conformation is the highest level of folded structure for this protein. Many proteins, however, are made up of multiple polypeptides. Each polypeptide within such a protein is referred to as a subunit of that protein. When two or more subunits interact to form a functional protein, this gives rise to the quaternary conformation. Let's watch the levels of protein structure again, from the amino acid sequence of the polypeptide to the secondary conformation and tertiary conformation all the way to the three-dimensional quaternary conformation it adopts in a multi-subunit protein. What drives proteins to fold into their secondary, tertiary, and quaternary levels of conformation? The driver is a protein's primary amino acid sequence, which carries the information for its final functional conformation. But how does the sequence determine a protein's folded structure? And how is this folded conformation stabilized? The answer to this, in part, lies in the many weak non-covalent bonds that are formed both within the polypeptide and between the polypeptide and the aqueous environment. The final protein structure is further stabilized by a phenomenon known as the hydrophobic effect. Ionic interactions, also referred to as electrostatic interactions, are the strongest types of non-covalent interactions, and they occur between oppositely charged groups. Amino acid side chains with opposite charges, such as glutamate and lysine, will form an ionic bond. This is an example of an attractive electrostatic interaction. Non-covalent interactions between two polar molecules are weaker. One important example of such an interaction is the hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonds are formed between an electronegative atom like oxygen and a hydrogen atom that is covalently linked to another electronegative atom. Such bonds between the polypeptide backbone groups are critical in forming secondary structures in proteins. To see the importance of hydrogen bonds, let's look at how they function in an alpha helix. As you can see, in this configuration, repetitive hydrogen bonds are formed between the backbone amides of an N and N plus 4 amino acyl residue. Likewise, the beta sheet structures are also formed by repeated hydrogen bonds between the backbone amide groups of adjacent beta strands. 
Other than the backbone groups, where else can you predict the formation of hydrogen bonds in polypeptides? Correct. Side chains of polar amino acyl residues can also participate in hydrogen bonding. Also keep in mind that in the aqueous environment, water molecules can also form hydrogen bonds with polar groups on the polypeptide, as well as with other water molecules. Even nonpolar groups can form favorable interactions. This is because of fluctuating electrical charges. This broad group of interactions between nonpolar molecules are known as van der Waals interactions. One example of a van der Waals interaction is the induced dipole-induced dipole interaction. As you can see, when these two methyl groups approach one another, their electron clouds distort, creating temporary induced dipoles. These induced dipole-induced dipole bonds are transient due to the temporary nature of the dipoles. Although individually weak, when many such weak non-covalent bonds are formed, they greatly contribute to the functional conformation of proteins. Finally, the phenomenon of the hydrophobic effect is also an important driver of protein folding. The hydrophobic effect can be broadly defined as the tendency of nonpolar groups in aqueous solutions to interact with each other to bury themselves away from water. Burying hydrophobic groups away from water contributes to the stabilization of the system in which the proteins are folding by ensuring the free movement of water molecules around the protein. The final protein structure is a result of the many non-covalent interactions described here and the hydrophobic effect acting together. In summary, there are four levels of protein structure, each driven and stabilized by the hydrophobic effect, as well as many weak non-covalent interactions. These interactions can occur both within the polypeptide, as well as between the protein and its aqueous environment. By understanding the different bonds and driving forces that contribute to folding, we can compare the stability of folded and unfolded proteins and examine why folding is energetically favorable.